right here in front. It is thanks to her we were able to reach out to the Iranian American community living in this area, in the Sacramento area. It is thanks to Swat Joseph's efforts that we were able to connect with the community. And from the community, uh, I would like to thank all of them, but I would like to uh, especially mention uh, the Rahimian family, Mr. Jawad Rahimian, who couldn't be here tonight, and Mrs. Shirin Rahimian. Without, without them, without them, we couldn't do this. I, I, I mean, those of you who are connected to the university know really well, in the last three, four years, we have seen nothing but cuts from all over. Uh, yesterday I was at Stanford giving a lecture, and they don't have such problems. Uh, and yet, and yet, they were asking me about our Iranian studies lectures. They were asking me to uh, coordinate with them so that we could share some of our speakers with them, and they are very interested in YouTube, and they, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you more about that later. So, uh, we are doing really well, thanks to you, thanks to the community support that we are receiving. So, again, I would really like to thank you, Mrs. Shirin Rahimian, thank you so much for making this possible. And Professor Swat Joseph, who had the will and energy to make it possible to connect us to the community. And then to all of you students, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate your presence, not just the community members, the students, the undergraduate students. I really appreciate that you're here. Thanks so much. The third lecture in this series will be in the spring quarter. Uh, I'll introduce that one very, very briefly so that you know. Wednesday, April 17th. And we will have Asaf Bayat, uh, Professor of Sociology and Middle East Studies from University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He'll be coming on uh, Wednesday, April 17th. One other thing, we have these uh, evaluation forms. Uh, if you have picked one up, please do fill it out and leave it with us so that we get some feedback from you. This lecture happens thanks to the community support and then also <coughs> thanks to a great team of staff, very dedicated. Gurjit Mount is right there. Uh, she is our program coordinator. And then, uh, I have one, a wonderful couple of students, Geet and Sophia, who reach out to all of you, let you know that we are having these things from Facebook, from the website, and I would like to thank them too. Geet, Sophia, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. And then, please, if there are empty seats, get closer and leave the empty seats at the edges so that other people can come and sit because we are at the limit of our capacity. So if there are empty seats in the middle, move to them and leave the empty seats on the edges for newcomers. Tonight we are very happy and glad to have uh, Dr. Wendy de Souza to talk about women in conflict, female masculinities in modern Iranian history. Uh, Wendy D'Souza, Dr. D'Souza, was, as you might have seen already on the post poster, was first one of the first exchange group students who went to Iran uh, to after the revolution. So that, that was a very significant group because it is not being, uh, it's not happening very often again. It, it, it is very difficult if those of, for those of you who are interested. Uh, it is not easy to study Iran as an American if you don't have, you don't happen to have some Iranian uh, nationality. It is very difficult. In that sense, she's a gem to find who knows Persian, uh, knows the sources, has been there and done research. Uh, and we are very lucky to have her. She happens to be with us this year as the Parsa Community Foundation visiting lecturer in Iranian studies, for which we once again have to thank the community that made it possible so that we can have a lecture every year uh, to teach two courses on Iranian studies uh, every academic year. And this year, we were very lucky to have Dr. D'Souza doing it for us. She received her PhD from UCLA. Before coming here, she taught at UCLA. She also taught at California State University, Sacramento, uh, where uh, one of her supervisors happens to be a colleague of mine and 
from her, I heard all the best things about her teaching, her connections with the students, uh, which are only being repeated again. I already hear great things about her classes uh, this quarter. She's teaching two courses for us, one undergraduate lecture course on Iranian history and one more specific course on gender. Gender is what she studies, gender and sexuality. Uh, that is her research specialty. Her research received funding from France, and she was able to go with a fellowship to, uh, uh, well, my French is not very good, but it is Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales. Uh, those of you who are a little familiar with France would have to know this. This is a very big institution over there. She was a fellow there. Uh, she is about to publish, she published a number of articles related to gender, but I'll just repeat the one, I'll just give you the name of the one that's about to come. The Love That Dare Not Be Translated, Erasures of Sexuality in the Modern Study of Sufism. So she's a scholar of gender and sexuality with a focus on Iran, which is very nice for us to have on campus. I hope we can keep her around. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much for listening to this great lecture now. Wendy? for that very lovely introduction, uh, as he always has is such a warm and kind uh, gesture all the time. Thank you to all of you who have gathered tonight, to Professor Soed Joseph, uh, and of course the Rahimian family, as Baki mentioned, who's made this lecture possible. I'd also like to dedicate this lecture to my wonderful students, um, to my mentor, Daisaku Ikeda, and to my mother. So we're going to have a soundless uh, video. I might just have to do this for you, but I don't know myself. <laughs> I'll show this to you in the end when we figure out how the sound works. Okay. Okay. So the lecture today is entitled uh, Women in Conflict Female Masculinities in Modern Iranian History. Um, and so I start the video with a, a um, example of women who dance, a, a dance in Iran called the Jahidi dance, which is a woman dressed in men's clothes, um, doing these very um, kind of bold and strong moves. Uh, in the end, I hope to show you that video. Thank you so much. Should we try it now? Yes. Thank you. 
This lecture is brought to you by. So Jamila is uh, talking about how she was the first woman in Iran to perform this dance called the Jahili dance. Uh, Iranians also know this as Baba Karam. And uh, so she's uh, actually performing this now. The music is really nice. <laughs> So the video that I just showed you um, is a performer, John Day, who performed this dance in Iran 35 years ago. She, she uh, is the first woman to do this. And both, while both men and women performed this dance, some of you might have seen this before, um, I thought it was a good way to open up my talk by showing one example of how women have performed masculinity in Iran. So in this talk tonight, I'm going to talk about five main aspects of female masculinity. Um, the first is I'd like to talk about theories about gender and masculinity in Iran. Second, I would like to talk about women, war, and conflict. Third, I will discuss how uh, religious ceremonies and plays feature female masculinity. Fourth, I will talk about female domesticity. And fifth, I will talk about female masculinity and uh, transvestism. Scholars have argued that masculinity, or socially enforced norms of manhood that emphasize toughness, stoicism, acquisitiveness, and self-reliance, is a concept used to reinforce and justify ideas about women's inferiority. Masculinity is seen as the opposite of femininity, and femininity, in turn, is seen as dominant in women and denied in men. Masculinity has also been seen as all-pervasive, hegemonic, since ideas about male masculinity are institutionalized through the media to, to appear natural and normal. Gender theists have argued that hegemonic masculinity is used by the ruling class of a society to establish and maintain domination. By formulating ideas about the masculine and the feminine person uh, from sexed bodies, Societies perpetuate the global dominance of men over women, the subordination of women, and an imposed hierarchy among men. So this line of thinking helps us to understand how ideas about gender are produced, but in some ways it limits our understanding of how people depart from the masculine or feminine cultural model. Maybe some of you already feel that you do this. For example, one way we reify the idea of male domination is by reading masculinity as a male trait. And since it is more powerful than femininity, we conclude that men are more powerful. Following this logic, all women can do is to resist or succumb to patriarchal imposed categories of womanhood, but they do not have a say in defining their own gender identities. <clears throat> in fact, Hegemonic masculinity may be little more, in one scholar's words, like the Wizard of Oz, a tenuous, vulnerable figure hiding out behind a screen of smoke and mirrors. 
For those of you in the audience who are not scholars of gender uh, theory, let me rephrase the problem a different way. I recently had a discussion with one of my students uh, in which uh, we were talking about how Iranian women are always being portrayed in the media as oppressed victims. Her response to me was, but aren't they? She had me for a moment. My response was, can we acknowledge obstacles to women's progress while also acknowledging women's agency? Helene Radiker has written about how in the 1980s feminist scholars rejected what was termed victim feminism, where too much emphasis on women's oppression rendered invisible their resistance. More recently, scholars such as R.W. Connell have also reconsidered the hegemonic masculinity thesis, criticizing its assumptions uh, and calling it a more complex model of gender hierarchy, one that includes calling for a more complex model that includes women's agency. I suggest one way of highlighting women's agency is by looking how, at how women construct their own masculinity. In her book, Female Masculinity, Judith Halverson anticipated the need for a theory that postulates about masculinity without men. She uses a scavenger methodology, much like what I use, and queer theory to show how masculinity has been traditionally tied to maleness and to power and to domination. She provides one of the first in-depth analyses of how gender identity and sexual nonconformity is rendered illegible by traditional approaches to women's history. So um, I, I've been really inspired by Judith Halberstam and through her insights, um, I've been inspired to seek ways of writing histories of women um, that isn't just anecdotal, um, what we call ad women and stir, um, but it's actually something that challenges uh, the traditional historical narrative. So this is what I, I'm trying to do in this uh, talk. So my second point, what I'm going to talk about um, is female masculinity as a challenge uh, to the traditional narrative about women. Masculinity has been associated with men and manhood due to the assumption that war and conflict are dominated by men. The theater of war, for example, has been portrayed um, in historical accounts as a stage for contests of male masculinity, where boys become real men and women are the spoils of war. The history of women's participation in violent conflict, therefore, has virtually been erased from historical memory. The omission of the female warrior in historical writings on Iran is also an effect of European stereotypes about Islamic societies. Most of the 19th and early 20th century, European travel accounts assert that men dominate the public sphere while women are confined to the harem. My students know this really well. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Um, we can begin to adjust such misperceptions by examining surviving fragments in pre-modern Persian literature testifying to female heroism. The Persian epic Book of Kings, the Shahnameh by Ferdowsi, for example, features a female character named Gorda Farid, who fought the hero Sohrab using military weaponry and later bested him with her clever wit and was able to escape. In addition, a 16th century Italian traveler recalled how Ottoman soldiers were shocked to discover when men's battle gear was removed from slain soldiers following, following a great battle, some of the enemy combatants were Iranian women dressed like the men. Actually, the word is, the, um, the battle gear is literally translated as the clothes of the men of war. That's what they were wearing. Upon learning this, the Ottoman Sultan Selim reportedly issued an edict ordering that these women be given an honor, honorable military burial for their, quote, courage, strength, and love of country. In 19th century historical accounts, Shiite religious texts mention female heroism. Though Kamran al has argued that female heroism during the Qajar period was relegated to, quote, moral and logistical support to the martyrs from the sidelines during the battle, end quote, he also asserted that the Prophet Muhammad's daughter, Fatime, was seen as a significant martyr and source of emulation for both women and men. Alvai and Faye Shirazi have both asserted that Fatime and Zainab, who's the daughter of Ali, 
were symbols of martyrdom, though he claims they were still in the shadow of their male relatives. Peter Tilkowski, however, goes further and states that in the case of Zainab, male writers attested to her status as a heroic icon, writing about her, quote, manly qualities seen in women. At other times, modern Shiite texts claim that Zainab, quote, is not a woman due to her exemplary courage. In other words, Zainab's manly qualities are said to be shared by women and at the same time others deny it. Despite the fact that Shiite iconic women are portrayed outside the field of battle, Sunni women are depicted differently. Aisha, the Prophet Muhammad's youngest um, uh, wife, fought Ali at the Battle of the Camel as an army commander on the battlefield. Shiite narratives recall how Aisha, a political rival of Ali, led an army against him. Due to her special status as a wife of the Prophet, her life was spared when she lost. Only much later, Shiite and Sunni sources condemn her participation as a transgression of female gender roles. Denise Spellberg has written about how Aisha's heavy involvement in politics was censured as a member of the new Muslim fe uh, female elite and the most highly visible member of the Prophet's wives. Her involvement raised questions about the powerful role of the Prophet's wives in determining Islamic succession. And I really like, actually, more recently, um, an Islamic studies scholar has shown that this uh, hadith, supposedly attributed to the Prophet, attesting to um, you know, the, the ill fate of politics when women are involved, or criticizing uh, the role of women in politics, was actually a later invention by um, a governor of Basra who had to justify why he didn't go to war to defend the caliphate. So he blames it on Aisha. Iranian European writers recall the courage and sacrifice of women during the Constitutional Revolution of 1905 to 1911. In Yoel Mirza's book, Iran and the Iranians, written at John Hopkins University from 1911 to 1913, he wrote about the new women of Persia who resisted Muhammad Ali's repression of the Constitution. He recalled that women gave money secured by selling their personal jewels and ornaments that they smuggled documents, discussed politics with foreign statesmen, and beseeched the parliament to hear their demands, while, quote, flourishing revolvers and vowing to take the lives of their husbands and sons and kill themselves if their petition uh, was ignored. Under a just cause, we can surmise by Mirza's words that women's use of violence was good for the nation since it served the cause of freedom. Mirza went so far as to stress how constitutionalist women were willing to endure physical harm, risking their lives when men's hearts grew weak. He stated, it's not too much to say that without the powerful word force, by which he means forming secret societies, uh, propagating progressive constitutional ideas, um, those so-called chattels of oriental lords of creation um, would have paled uh, next to these brave women. The women did much to keep the spirit of liberty alive, having themselves suffered from a double form of oppression, political and social. Um, so that's one account of this, these brave constitutionalist women. And there's another one um, that also talks about armed protest during this time. Quote, out from their walled courtyards and harems marched 300 of that weak sex with the flush of undying determination in their cheeks. They were clad in plain black robes with the white nets of their veils dropped over their faces. Many held pistols under their skirts or in the folds of their sleeves. Straight to the parliament they went. So the image of the veiled woman carrying pistols uh, clearly mocks the notion of harem seclusion. For Mirza, Iranian women were like Queen Esther in saving their country and the most progressive, not to say radical, in the world. Later in the 1940s, we have other examples of how women not only participated in armed conflict, but also identified with heroism. In, in, a, in a book called Memoirs of a Two-Day Woman, Two Day Woman uh, the Two-Day is a, a, one of the main communist parties in Iran, uh, in this memoir, Razie Ibrahim Zadeh discussed how she was involved in the political wing of the Two-Day National Army. 
um, and she did reconnaissance work. Returning to Azerbaijan on a mission, she was captured by border guards uh, and arrested. In her memoir, Ibrahim Zadeh wrote about what she wore at the time of her arrest. Quote, a skirt over thick pants, an army shirt, a zippered leather coat and boots, and a utility belt. And under her shirt, a concealed pistol. When army officers brought her to the police station to get her to turn in her weapon, she cleverly took advantage of the situation. She writes, from the accent of the officer who had just come in, it was obvious he was Azerbaijani. And Azeris have a special attitude toward their compatriots, compatriots, especially women. And I wanted to take advantage of the situation and do something before the officer left the room. So in this way, my plan was hatched, almost by itself. I brought my hands down from my chest, and I slapped the face of the soldier who was pressing my arms. And I yelled, little man, is your intention to untie my hands or play with my breasts? The sound of the slap, along with my shouts, echoed in the room, and both officers noticed us. My plan had worked. The honor of the Azeri officer was inflamed, and I was saved from the beatings." Quote. As an Azeri herself, she calculated that the army officers would avoid throwing her to the ground or ripping her clothes out of consideration for male and female honor. For those of you familiar with these terms, Aydats and Namus. Though they beat her with a pistol on the arms and thighs in order to get her to turn in her gun, she decided instead to endure physical torture rather than give up her gun. She could not think of anything but resisting them, and she stated that she didn't even feel pain. Quote, my physical tolerance was not less than a man's. Though to not be killed by the pressures and blows of the tortures, my strength increased several fold. Ibrahim Zadeh's story is meant to show her commitment to lofty goals, such as Azeri independence, and primarily her physical sacrifice in realizing these goals. In her memoir, she strongly identifies with traits traditionally associated with men, like enduring pain and hardship, fighting for a just cause, and love for her gun. She also distanced herself from the two-day party members who wanted her to perform traditional gender roles. She writes, Sometimes the two-day party would give me a mission to put on a chic dress, rouge and lipstick, and wear high heel shoes, and go to a certain man or family and establish a relationship with them. But I was fundamentally not interested in lipstick and makeup, and I didn't like these kind of things, and therefore, I would oppose these orders. I would always be reprimanded or criticized by the people who gave the orders. This behavior of the le leadership caused me to refuse their orders altogether, for this reason, they have given me nicknames such as anarchist, stubborn, and so-and-so Zainab. I find it interesting here that uh, Zainab is used uh, to connote a woman who is rebellious. Ibrahim Zadeh eventually leaves the two-day party and gets involved in the Azeri revolution. After spending time in Ghazni in prison, um, she eventually leaves for Germany, and she recently actually passed away in, uh, in Germany. Female masculinity is not only about participating in wars and carrying guns. Rather, it is the way women identify with heroism and how men saw women as heroes or fighting for a just cause. The third aspect of female masculinity that I will highlight are cultural representations.